Ladies and gentlemen, with all of the best plans of mice and men, uh, I can't turn the damn microphone on. All right? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm welcoming you to the 11th annual Dolan Lecture Series on behalf of the committee. And I want to make this introduction brief because this great gentleman has a wonderful message for us and we don't want to delay it. But I would like to recognize the Dolan family. Please don't stand up, all right? <laughs> Dr. and Mrs. Dolan, Christine Dolan, uh, Bill and Jeff Dolan, and John and Carol Dolan, and Kathleen Dolan, who is the daughter of Bill and Jeff. And Kathleen joins this distinguished family as a member of the bar which makes four Dolans, Bill, Kathleen, John, and Carol. Uh, Jeff Cummings and I were talking about what that could mean in the future. Uh, a, a correct size door would be Dolan, 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 and Dolan. <laughs> but even more, in the changing society, it could be a legal health maintenance organization by the Dolans. <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce, recognize the members of the committee, please. Uh, John Dolan, already recognized, Dr. Bill Dolan, Judy Fox, Dr. Larry Gatos, Dr. Don Nolan, and Dr. Bob Ryan. You all have a copy of uh, Dr. Jeff Cummings' vitae and accomplishments, but I will tell you that we had to shorten a little bit his, his credits. Uh, when he sent it to me, it was very, very uh, amazing. It was like the Northern Virginia phone book. And, uh, so in order to fit the program, we've had to shrink it down a little bit. But Dr. Cummings, uh, incidentally, a delightful gentleman, is here to talk to us about a subject that's very dear to our hearts and our minds. Uh, having been raised in an Irish family where we had two newspapers a day, uh, both papers were opened immediately to the Irish sports pages, which were the obituaries. And the habit still prevails in my household. The first thing I open up is the Irish sports pages. And I was mentioning to Dr. Cummings that uh, this disease gets a bad rap more and more in the papers every day. The obituaries list he had or she had Alzheimer's. The doctor will develop that uh, the uh, truth of this, why people die who have had or had Alzheimer's. Without any more uh, delay, I would welcome Dr. Jeff Cummings to our community and to our community hospital. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. Uh, I'm aware, Dr. Dolan, that uh, when uh, a lectureship is named in someone's honor, it's because uh, he is highly esteemed and highly loved, and it is a great pleasure for me to come and give this lecture, which honors you. And I'm aware of your accomplishments and your contributions to this medical center. So uh, thank you very much for allowing me to be the person who gives this lecture. I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease. And we can just bring the lights down a little bit in, in front. Thank you. I'm going to stand out here so I can see my slides. I don't remember them. That's part of the uh, problem. <laughs> you see why I'm so interested in this work. <laughs> now, I'm going to set the stage a little bit for why Alzheimer's disease is so important. I think that you have a sense of why it's important and its increasing frequency, but I want to go through that just a little bit. And then I'm going to go through these aspects of the disease that I think uh, are so important to understanding where we are now with regard to Alzheimer's disease. For example, there are three uh, chromosomes carrying mutations known to cause Alzheimer's disease. So when they say we don't know what causes Alzheimer's disease, it's false. In those families, we know what causes Alzheimer's disease. And it's only a matter of time between going from those families where we know to other families where other discoveries will be made. 
So there's been tremendous advance. I want to talk about risk factors because most people with Alzheimer's disease do not have mutations. They have a series of risk factors which place them at greater risk for Alzheimer's disease. And I think that's an important story. We're going to talk about the protective factors. Uh, here we'll talk about what makes people more likely to have AD here, what makes people less likely to have AD, an equally important part of the story. I'll then walk you through the amyloid cascade. Increasingly, there is agreement among neuroscientists to the extent that there is ever agreement among neuroscientists uh, that amyloid is the central player in Alzheimer's disease. That it is the accumulation of amyloid in the brain which causes this disorder. And when we discover a way for amyloid not to accumulate, we will be able to end uh, the plague of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a very focused bit of research. Uh, what we currently have available to us are cholinesterase inhibitors and the cholinergic deficit is a product of the amyloid cascade. So I'll try to put that into uh, the formula. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about cerebral reserve and the fact that each of us has some different uh, level of protection or vulnerability to the illness that represents uh, cerebral reserve. So let me start by just setting the stage a little bit. First, by showing you what happens, uh, what's happening to the U.S. population. I think you're most of you are aware of this, that this is uh, millions of persons in the U.S. over the age of 65. Uh, so uh, we're right here in between this. So at this point, uh, there's uh, about 35 million people over the age of 65 in the United States. And you can see that uh, by 2010, that'll be up to 40 million. And by 2030, the baby boomer uh, blip in the population will strike. Uh, and when that occurs, there will be about 70 million elderly individuals in the U.S. population. And that is going to be a striking change. And unless we know how to prevent or treat Alzheimer's disease effectively by that time, there's going to be uh, a major problem in terms of financing uh, long-term care. So this represents uh, really a very major threat. Uh, it's particularly important to me because I am a member just a tiny member, but I am a member of that green bar there, uh, and uh, so it's important to me that we find effective treatment. Now, this is uh, the aging of the population is important with regard to Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's disease doubles in frequency every five years after the age of 60. So that it's quite unusual in 60-year-olds, only about 1% of 60-year-olds have Alzheimer's disease. 2% at 65, 4% at 70, 8% at 75, 16% at 80, and about 30% or one person in every three over the age of 85 has Alzheimer's disease. One person in every three. And that is the fastest growing part of the U.S. population, the population over age 85. So that is a very striking factor uh, and one that, that uh, 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 places, uh, gives the urgency, the public health urgency, to uh, treating and developing new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Now, here's the man for whom the disease is named, Alois Alzheimer. He uh, wrote the paper that we would all like to write uh, as academicians. It's three pages long. In it, he describes both the characteristic clinical picture and the characteristic pathological picture of Alzheimer's disease. And that's why that paper has lived and established him uh, as the, the preeminent describer of the disease. And I'll jump ahead to say that he described both the neuropsychological deficits and some of the behavioral disturbances that are common in Alzheimer's disease. So he anticipated much of the clinical phenomenology of Alzheimer's disease. Now, one very interesting thing about Alzheimer's patient was that she was 55 years old. So for a long time, it was believed that Alzheimer's disease was a disease of younger people. And the, the loss of memory that occurred in people over the age of 65 was something different. And it was called senility or senile dementia. But as uh, the pathological studies increased and more and more people uh, uh, were, were investigated, it was clear that exactly the same disease occurs over 65 and under 65. Isn't that a surprise that the retirement age actually has nothing to do with when somebody gets a disease? And indeed, all of the cases that were thought to be senile dementia are Alzheimer's disease. So that we know that that's why this is a common disease of the elderly and that a normal elderly person 
does have some slowing of accurate recall of tiny bits of information, such as the name of a person that you ought to know, right? This has probably happened to you, maybe even today, uh, that you see somebody, you remember everything that you've done with them before, uh, you only have three steps to make a socially appropriate response. <laughs> Hello there, mister. Uh, <laughs> and you can't remember the name. That is perfectly normal. That's not senile dementia, and it's not Alzheimer's disease. But people who have true pathological abnormalities of memory and do not know the date and cannot remember what happened yesterday to them, that is likely to be Alzheimer's disease. And it is a recognition that senile dementia is Alzheimer's disease has greatly uh, advanced our understanding of the illness. Now, here's the way we currently would diagnose Alzheimer's disease. It, it used to be said that Alzheimer's disease was a diagnosis of exclusion. It's not true. We have a specific profile of clinical findings which we expect to find in the Alzheimer patient, and if they're not there, we don't make the diagnosis. And by applying these criteria, which combine inclusion and exclusion, we are now accurate about 85 or 95 percent of the time in terms of predicting accurately the diagnosis if the patient comes to autopsy. So that's very good. 85 or 90 percent is probably as good as we can expect on the basis of clinical diagnosis. So we can make the diagnosis clinically, and it is an inclusionary diagnosis. Those are two shifts in our uh, clinical approach to Alzheimer's disease. So what we expect is that the patient will have the onset of symptoms between the ages of 40 and 90. There will be this triad of abnormalities, memory loss, language disturbance, and visual spatial changes. So we ask them to remember three words in three minutes. They have difficulty recalling that. We ask them to uh, name as many animals as they can in one minute. A normal person can do 18 animals in one minute. Uh, Alzheimer patients have a lot of trouble uh, getting to that number. And we ask them to, do, to copy some figures like overlapping pentagons, and they have difficulty with that. The disease is of insidious onset and gradual progression. It's very important because it means that we rarely see an early patient. Because what happens is um, mom begins to ask the same question again and again. Dad takes over the checkbook. Um, um, mom seems to be a little confused sometimes. Then there was that time last year when she got turned around in the airport and we couldn't find her for three hours. And then last week, she turned onto this freeway off ramp the wrong way. And so she comes in, is brought in by her family for a clinical evaluation. But of course, the symptoms have been present for two years by that time because it's insidious and progressive. And it's not until you cross the family's threshold or bringing them to clinical attention that, that a patient is assessed. When you examine the patients, in addition to memory language and visual spatial changes, there are no focal abnormalities such as a hemiparesis that would indicate a stroke and no gait abnormalities such as in Parkinsonism. As a matter of fact, there are no motor changes in this disease until quite late in the illness, say the last two or three years of the disease. And it is incumbent on us to make sure that there is no alternate explanation by getting the routine studies that you're used to of the thyroid level and the B12 level, that sort of thing that excludes other causes of dementia. And by applying this carefully, uh, we are able to diagnose the disease accurately, uh, relatively uh, frequently. Now, here's the process that I want to walk you through in the rest of this lecture. Uh, that is, when, when we describe the dementia syndrome of Alzheimer's disease, it's down here. And what this means is that all of this has already happened in the brain by the time the patient is diagnosable. So that you can see that one of the great scientific challenges that we face is how do we identify people who are in the very earliest phases of this disease, maybe even before memory impairment has occurred? Are there some biological markers? Are there other behavioral markers that might, are, are, are there, is there a risk factor profile that would allow us to know who to treat? So that's what we're looking for. But at this point, we think the overall process is that in a small group of patients, mutations will produce amyloid, uh, increased amyloid production or aggregation in the brain. Uh, and one of the unique things is that every mutation discovered to date has one common outcome increased amyloid in the brain. And that is one of the most powerful supports for the idea that amyloid is central to the process. 
Most people do not have a mutation. Most people have a series of risk factors that either increase amyloid in the brain, and I'll tell you about those, or they make nerve cells more vulnerable to injury by amyloid, and I'll tell you about those. As the amyloid uh, accumulates in the brain, it kills adjacent nerve cells. That nerve cell loss contributes to the dementia syndrome. The nerve cell loss also kills cells that produce critical chemicals, such as acetylcholine, and that contributes to the dementia syndrome. So I'm going to walk you through the different phases of this diagram to try to give you an understanding of where we are with our current understanding of Alzheimer's disease. So here's the, the mutation story, and it, it's important for a, for a few reasons. Uh, the first mutation to be discovered was that in Down syndrome. That is, every person with Down syndrome who survives into midlife gets Alzheimer's disease. That amazing fact. Every person with, with Down syndrome who survives into midlife gets Alzheimer's disease. So it was clear that there's something about having three copies of chromosome 21 which, will, which, is, which, which makes one have Alzheimer's disease, which is a cause of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and the, uh, the gene for amyloid is on chromosome 21. So this was a big hint that the amyloid in the brain, which was clearly visible, and the genetic abnormality were going to be linked. So then they began to look to see, well, maybe all people with Alzheimer's disease have a mutation on chromosome 21. They don't have Down syndrome, but maybe they have a mutation. And a very small number of families were discovered who have a mutation on 21. Only a couple of families so far. It's a rare mutation. But a lot of families were found uh, that have a mutation on chromosome 14. Um, by a lot, I mean perhaps 20 or 30 families by now. And this is called, the, the gene is called presenilin 1. Uh, and this accounts for most familial early onset Alzheimer's disease. By early onset, I mean onset of the disease before age 55. So the kind of classical patient that Alzheimer described, she probably uh, may have carried the chromosome 14 mutation. Statistically, it would be likely that she had the chromosome 14 mutation. There's another uh, group of families uh, who have a mutation on chromosome 1 in a gene called presenilin 2. These are known as the Volga Germans uh, because they started off in Germany. They then all moved to an area of the Volga River in Russia, uh, and then they moved to the United States. And in that group, there was a, one person who had Alzheimer's disease. And he had many children and, and had what's called a founder effect uh, in that all of the families with chromosome, 21, with chromosome 1 mutations can be traced back to that one group of migrants uh, from the Volga River. I, I, um, I recently was dictating a report on this, and my secretary misunderstood and, and transcribed it as the vulgar Germans. Uh, so I was, I was uh, glad that I picked that up at the right moment before it got into press. Uh, so this is our current uh, understanding. This accounts for, it's very rare to see these early onset families. So it's only about 5% of Alzheimer's disease patients who have one of these mutations. But because they all cause increased amyloid in the brain, they provide a wonderful window on what causes Alzheimer's disease. Because people who have these mutations get the disease. Uh, it's a one-to-one -on -one -one correspondence. The other thing that this mutation has allowed us to do is for the first time to create mice that have Alzheimer's disease. Now, you might not think that that's a great advance. I mean, aren't mice bad enough? And now we have demented mice. Uh, you know, did we really need demented mice? Was that a real contribution? Um, but of course, it is very important to have mice with Alzheimer's disease because it means that they uh, will develop the disease and drugs can be screened very rapidly because the mice develop at about age uh, uh, nine or 10 months. Uh, and you can give drugs that maybe prevent amyloid or, uh, or move amyloid out of the brain or prevent its aggregation in the brain. And you can test many, many more drugs in a, in a mouse colony with these mutations. These are called transgenic mice because they have the human gene. Uh, then you can uh, in cl human clinical trials, which cost millions of dollars and takes many years to do. So the transgenic mice colonies, which were created by taking this uh, mutation and putting it into uh, the fetal cells of a mouse and then allowing that mouse to grow up, has been very instrumental in advancing our understanding of Alzheimer's disease. But as I said, most patients don't have a mutation. Most patients have some series of risk factors that make Alzheimer's disease more likely. What are those risk factors? Well, I already mentioned that the primary one is age. 
Uh, that is, the disease doubles in frequency every five years after the age of 60. So the older the person, the more likely they are to get AD. Women are more likely to have Alzheimer's disease uh, than men. Now, there are many, many, many more women with Alzheimer's disease than men because they live longer, and therefore they live into the risk period, and therefore they get it at higher rates. But if you account for differences in longevity, there is still about 1.2 women for every one man with Alzheimer's disease. So there is something about being a woman which increases the likelihood that the person is going to get Alzheimer's disease. A history of head trauma will increase the likelihood that someone is going to get Alzheimer's disease. And head trauma does two things. It disturbs the number of synaptic relationships between nerve cells, and there is a great release of amyloid at the moment that the individual's head hits the steering wheel uh, and, and, uh, and loses consciousness. And so amyloid is a part of the head trauma process. A small head size is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and this has stood up against many statistical challenges because it's so illogical. Um, nevertheless, it's there, it's held up. Um, the thinking is that uh, you know, people with small heads don't actually have small neurons, they have fewer of them. Uh, and that changes the threshold for the expression of an amyloid burden uh, uh, during the human lifespan. And finally, having an ApoE4 genotype is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is so important that I need to expand on it a little bit. Uh, apolipoproteins are cholesterol-bearing proteins that all of us need to get cholesterol into the liver, where it's involved in normal liver metabolism, and to get it into the brain, where it's involved with normal brain metabolism. So we need apolipoproteins, and we need cholesterol. And there are three types of apolipoprotein, type 2, type 3, and type 4. And each of us inherits one of these types from our mom and one of these types from our dad. So each of us has some combination of 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 3, 3, 3, 4, or 4, 4. Okay? So we all have that combination. And this is not a mutation. This is something that is distributed in the population. And in this auditorium, 20% of individuals will have an ApoE4 allele. And that 20% has then increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Because individuals who do not have the E4 have a 15% lifetime risk of having AD. People with one copy, that is they got it from either mom or dad, have a 30% lifetime risk of getting AD. People who have two copies, that is they have a double four genotype, have a 60% risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Now, is this the blood test for Alzheimer's disease? Is this what we've been looking for so we can have a blood test for Alzheimer's disease? It isn't, because 15% of people with the best genotype go on to get the illness. So if you reassured them, you would have reassured them falsely. And 40% of people with the worst genotype do not go on to get the illness, so you would have alarmed them falsely. So it's not a blood test for Alzheimer's disease. But it is certainly a risk factor, and a very powerful one, because there's a gene dose effect that doubles with each copy of the gene that you get. And it has greatly spurred on the research about Alzheimer's disease. So uh, we are working more and more with E4. Uh, people who have dementia and an E4 allele almost certainly have Alzheimer's disease. So it can be used to augment diagnosis, even though it cannot be used as a predictive test for AD. Uh, there's also a decreased age of onset, so with two E4s, the disease begins around 65, with uh, one E4 around 75. It's present in the plaque, and we're going to come, uh, come to plaques in a moment, uh, but, but we think that the role of E4 is really to help glue amyloid together, so that the people with the E4 genotype are not able to move amyloid through the brain in the normal way. It gets, uh, it gets uh, agglutinated aggregated, and then changes configuration to produce toxicity. So that may well be the role of E4 that's being worked out. Now we've talked about risk factors. What about protective factors? And I think these are equally important. One is education. It's clear when you go to societies where there are illiterate individuals and highly literate individuals that there is more AD in the illiterate individuals than in the literate individuals. Now, obviously, Alzheimer's disease strikes very intelligent people. We all know examples of that. But if you look across the population, it is the low end of the population that gets more Alzheimer's disease than the high end in terms of, of uh, educational level. 
So I feel particularly good because if you're paying attention, I'm actually helping you fight Alzheimer's disease. And those of you who are sleeping will bear the consequences of not paying to my attention. <laughs> Native intelligence also correlates with the likelihood of getting AD. People of lower native intelligence are more likely to get the disease. People with higher are less likely. The APOE2 genotype may be protective. That's a, uh, something that looks increasingly likely. If someone has taken non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, they, have, they are less likely to uh, manifest Alzheimer's disease. And I'm going to show you that data a little bit later in the lecture just to show you how, how interesting that is. And then women who have taken postmenopausal estrogen replacement therapy are also at diminished risk compared to women who have not taken uh, estrogen replacement therapy. So there appears to be uh, a, a fact, an estrogen factor as well. Again, I'm going to show you those data as we go along. But it's important to, to realize that not only are we shaping our understanding of who's at risk for the disease, but we're also trying to shape, of our, shape our understanding of, of what are the things that might be doable uh, in terms of preventing Alzheimer's disease from occurring. Remember that this is a disease that occurs late in life. So if we could delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease five years, we would decrease its frequency 50%. So a reasonable goal is just to, de just to, just to slow the onset by five years, and it would have a dramatic effect on the population, the elderly population. So that's what we're struggling for. OK, oops, sorry. So here's where we are. We've had a look at these mutations. We know that they are rare but informative. We've had a look at some risk factors and protective factors. Now let's turn to the, the central problem, which is the accumulation of amyloid in the brain. And, and here's the way we envision this process. Here's a nerve cell over here in red. And there's a very large protein called amyloid precursor protein a protein that comes before amyloid, amyloid precursor protein, or APP. An APP is a strange protein that sticks right through the cell membrane. So half of it is sticking outside of the cell, half of it is sticking inside the cell. It penetrates the cell. And right at the point where it penetrates is the, the 22 amino acid fragment that is amyloid. Okay? As long as it's in APP, no problem. It doesn't cause any havoc in the brain. It's not toxic. It doesn't kill nerve cells. It's fine. But this uh, amino acid fragment, I'm sure it's 42 amino acids, not 22 amino acids, is metabolized by lysosomes and then is freed within the cell and then is extruded from the cell where particularly in the presence of E4, but even in the absence of E4, it, it aggregates with other amyloid that's being produced to form a neuritic plaque in the brain and when that, when that plaque forms, it becomes toxic to the nerve cell and kills it. Now, this amyloid can be freed by an enzyme right there called beta secretase and an enzyme right there called gamma secretase. And if we had a secretase inhibitor, we would not have Alzheimer's disease. So you can imagine the, the enthusiasm with which the biotechnology companies are pursuing secretase inhibitors at this moment in order to identify that compound that could prevent freeing this amyloid fragment from amyloid precursor protein. And you see that there is, there is so much focus in the research agenda now that I think there is cause for optimism in terms of finding a potent drug that really will have an effect on this illness. Because it's not looking for a needle in a haystack. It's looking for a secretase inhibitor. That's a pretty focused research agenda. Uh, and, and I am uh, somewhat optimistic that we're going to find that. There are no such drugs in, in human trials now, but there's every reason to believe that, uh, that they will come to trial. Now, one of our problems is we don't exactly know what amyloid does that might be important and normal in the brain. And if we had a very potent inhibitor, we might turn off some critically important, important process. So that will all have to be worked out. But we are taking the first uh, exciting steps towards uh, finding drugs that really will have a tremendous effect on this illness. Now here is the amyloid plaque, just to show you what it looks like. These are like sort of Christmas balls hanging down in the cortex. They're round. They have an amyloid core in the middle. And these dark areas are dying nerve cells all around that central amyloid core. OK, so we've looked at amyloid now. What about the actual process of nerve cell loss itself? Because this is where we've actually made some therapeutic gains. 
And there are three areas of nerve cell loss that I think should be addressed. They are changes in the synaptic relationships among cells, the synaptic degeneration. They're the occurrence of neurofibrillary tangles within cells, the other principal pathology of this illness. And there's apoptosis, or nerve cell death itself. So what about synaptic degeneration? Well, this has been an interesting part of the Alzheimer's story, because it is uh, recent studies with synaptophysin, a stain that allow us to, allows us to look at synaptic density, shows that there is a loss of synapses early in AD and that the correlation between synaptic loss and dementia severity is very powerful. As a matter of fact, there's more relationship between synaptic loss and dementia severity than there is between amyloid and dementia severity. So the synaptic loss appears to be something that is really critically important in terms of the cognitive symptoms that the patient has. We also know that synapses are decreased by aging and trauma, two of the principal risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and they are increased by an enriched experience. So that the physical correlate of an enriched experience, this is done in rats where they put one rat in a UCLA-like environment, <laughs> and one rat in an impoverished environment, and then look at the synaptic connections of the rat in the enriched environment, there are many more synaptic relationships. So, so it looks like that is a product of the increased experience and therefore would make one less vulnerable to the early loss of synapses occurring in the course of Alzheimer's disease. Whereas if you had a, a condition like aging or trauma which diminished the availability of synapses, that person would be more likely to manifest the, the, uh, the effects of an of a, uh, amyloid burden in the brain. So synaptic degeneration appears to be very important. Here's just, uh, just to remind you what this looked like, here's a single neuron and remember that each neuron has hundreds of thousands of synaptic connections. And these are enriched in the, in the uh, enriched environment uh, and decreased in the impoverished environment. Now another major pathology of Alzheimer's disease uh, is uh, the production of the neurofibrillary tangle. And in the normal nerve cell, there are these neuronal uh, microtubules that have a normal protein called tau protein, all lined up across the microtubule and this assembly is critical to getting nutrients and other products from the cell base up to the end of the cell, which is the business end of the cell, the synaptic ending. In Alzheimer's disease, tau is phosphorylated. And as soon as it's phosphorylated, it undergoes a configurational change which leads to neurofibrillary tangles. And the tangles then lead to cell death because there can be no more transportation of nutrients and normal substances within the nerve cell. So that you can see again that as far as tangle formation goes, what we're looking for is some sort of phosphorylation inhibitor uh, and some, some way of blocking the phosphorylation process. We also know that ApoE3 appears to inhibit this phosphorylation process and therefore if we could augment or imitate the activity of ApoE3, then we might have a way of, of decreasing phosphorylation and therefore decreasing neurofibrillary tangle formation. So that's another exciting prospect. One of the things we don't know, one of the critical areas to understand, is what is the relationship between amyloid and neurofibrillary tangles? Note that I've cleverly avoided that in my scheme here because it's one of the big gaps in our knowledge. There are several theories that might relate the two, but there is no definite knowledge about how the two are linked. Here is a neurofibrillary tangle. Uh, this, you can see how dense this is uh, with the appropriate staining in the body of the nerve cell. Now here's what's happening to uh, the nerve cells themselves. They start off uh, with a robust dendritic and axonal domain, domain and as the amyloid is uh, deposited adjacent to them, uh, they, they lose their synaptic relationships uh, and eventually uh, wither and succumb to the illness. So that's what happens to the nerve cell in the brain. So supposing we couldn't have any effect on amyloid, could we make the nerve cell more resistant to the effects of amyloid? And that is the, the, uh, the theory underlying neuroprotective agents. And here we have the evidence I'm going to show you in a, mo in a moment for the utility of antioxidants. Because one of the things that amyloid does is to produce free radicals and oxidative cellular injury. And that's one of the processes by which amyloid kills nerve cells. So if we could stop 
free radical injury to nerve cells, we could then have a definite effect on Alzheimer's disease. There are two drugs that do that, and I'll show you those data in a moment. This is likely where the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs work and possibly where the estrogens work. Two areas where we do not yet have sufficient data but are being actively investigated are a possible role for calcium channel blockers because we know that when the cell dies, one of the final acts that occurs is the inrush of calcium through calcium channels, and that activates uh, enzymes in the cell that leads to cell death. So if we could stop the, the inrush of calcium, we might preserve neuronal life for a longer period of time. Uh, similarly, uh, NMDA receptor blockade might be useful because excitatory amino acids appear to lead to cell death, and the effect of excitatory amino acids can be blocked with NMDA receptor blockers. But let me show you the antioxidant story, because I think that this is really one of the most important therapeutic observations with regard to Alzheimer's disease made recently. This study was published by Mary Sano and, and uh, a bunch of us who are in the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, a multi-center group, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine after rigorous peer review in 1997. And what we did was to have four groups of patients with moderate Alzheimer's disease. And one of those groups got vitamin E, one group got selegiline, one group got vitamin E plus selegiline, and one group got placebo. And we followed those patients until one of three things happened. They died, they went into a nursing home, or they developed severe dementia. And when any of those things happened, then that was the end of the study for that particular patient. So the measure was, can we prolong the time that it takes for patients to reach one of these dramatic points in the evolution of Alzheimer's disease? And what you can see here is that the placebo patients reached one of those points on average at about 400 days. Whereas the vitamin E patients took over 600 days to reach one of those points. So there was a 25% slowing in the rate of progression of Alzheimer's disease who received vitamin E therapy. That is a remarkable observation. A 25% slowing is a remarkable effect uh, and, and uh, is the first indication that we can really intervene in the degenerative disease process. Selegiline had an equivalent effect, and vitamin E and selegiline had an equivalent effect. All of these three were non-statistically significantly different, and all of them were statistically superior to placebo. So giving both drugs does not help. And vitamin E is as good as selegiline. So we use vitamin E because selegiline is more expensive uh, and has more side effects. So patients in our program, on the basis of this study, receive 2,000 international units of vitamin E daily. Now that is industrial strength vitamin E, right? 2,000 international units. And at that dose, some people uh, will have bleeding because vitamin E is an anticoagulant. So you have to tell the patient, if you're going to do this, that if they have bleeding when they brush their teeth or blood in the urine or blood in the stool, that they're one of those rare people, and they're very rare, we've only seen one in hundreds of patients, but it, it does occur, um, that they're one of those people who cannot tolerate the high dose vitamin E and therefore must have a lower dose of, of vitamin E. But unless that happens, we treat everybody with 2,000 international units, except the very late stage patients, right? Some of our families will naturally say to us, you know, mom has been in a nursing home for two years and we have no reason to try to slow the disease at this point. Uh, so what we're trying to do is find ways of maintaining ability and decreasing the time of disability in the course of Alzheimer's disease. And this has been one of the most exciting advances in terms of our ability to do that. Now, estrogens also uh, appear to be uh, useful, but the data are much weaker. Let me say that right out front, that we do not yet have the same kind of clinical trial data for estrogens that we do for vitamin E. But if we look and we take women who have never received uh, estrogen replacement therapy and assign them a risk of one, then we can look at how much reduced is the risk for those women who received estrogen therapy for five years, 10 years, or greater than 10 years. And what you can see is there's about a 50% reduction in the occurrence of Alzheimer's disease in women who have received estrogen replacement therapy. So that, again, is a very remarkable and robust effect. It must be proven in a prospective clinical trial of estrogens. Uh, but in terms of an epidemiologic hint that estrogens may be very important, this is powerful data. 
Similarly, it looks like estrogens may be useful in women who have Alzheimer's disease. That is, here were women who were of similar age, similar education, had the disease for the same length of time and the same surgical history. That is, they were matched for the number of hysterectomized patients in the patient groups. And you can see that those who had estrogen replacement therapy had much higher cognitive scores on the mini mental state examination than those women who had never had estrogen replacement therapy. So this is evidence that not only the, do estrogens uh, make it less likely that the woman will manifest Alzheimer's disease, but in those women who have the disease, it also appears to ameliorate, ameliorate the severity of the illness. So uh, estrogens are under rigorous study at this point to determine exactly the preparation, uh, the dose, and the duration of therapy which would be appropriate. Now, what about non-steroidals? There's been a lot about this in the literature, uh, and uh, uh, this is another place where we have weaker data than we do for vitamin E, but still very exciting data. So uh, here's a study from the, from, the, uh, Boston, uh, the, from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study, some uh, place uh, right next door. In fact, maybe, maybe some of you even know members of the Baltimore Longitudinal Study. Um, and again, if you take a person who has never received non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and say that their risk for getting Alzheimer's disease is one, and what is the risk of somebody who was exposed to non-steroidals for either less than two years or more than two years? And again, you can see that there was almost a 50% reduction in the group that received non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So that's a pretty robust effect. And it wasn't just a medication-taking effect, because look here, there was almost no effect of aspirin. And unfortunately, those people who took Tylenol looked like they actually had an increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. So it really looked like it's pretty specific for the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and is not shared uh, by either the effect of aspirin or the effect of acetaminophen. So again, this is a great hint uh, that the inflammatory process in the brain that is stimulated by Alzheimer's disease may itself be part of the pathology. And therefore, by reducing the, non the inflammatory response, we may be able to preserve nerve cells and therefore enhance cognitive function. Okay, so we've looked at the process from amyloid to nerve cell loss. Now, what about the neurochemical deficit? This is uh, among the most well-studied uh, areas of Alzheimer's disease and one of the areas where we have uh, therapeutics available. So there are several neurochemical deficiencies in this illness, including um, uh, involvement of the nucleus basalis, which leads to a reduction in choline acetyl transferase and therefore of acetylcholine. Because that choline acetyltransferase is an enzyme necessary for the uh, manufacture of acetylcholine, and it is produced by nucleus basalis. There's also involvement of the locus ceruleus, leading to a noradrenergic deficit, and involvement of the rafe, leading to a serotonergic deficit. But we do not know any cognitive function of norepinephrine and serotonin. They may have mood effects, but they are not known to have any cognitive effects whereas acetylcholine is known to have uh, important cognitive, an important cognitive role. So uh, therefore, cholinesterase inhibitors have been developed. So this is a story in Alzheimer's disease, that there is loss of nucleus basalis cells and therefore a deficiency in choline acetyltransferase. This leads to a deficiency in the synthesis of acetylcholine. But those cholinergic receptors are still there. So if you can stimulate the cholinergic system, you could stimulate the receptor and therefore have, have a cognitive or behavioral response. So here is the uh, nucleus basalis at the base of the forebrain, outlined here in color. Uh, and here is the nucleus basalis here. So choline acetyltransferase is synthesized here and then transported out to all the different cortices where acetylcholine is manufactured. Now, what we have then to treat the deficit uh, are cholinesterase inhibitors. And the two that are available on the market are Cognex, or Tacrin, and Aricept, or Denepazil. Uh, and Cognex we really don't use anymore uh, because uh, it had to be monitored for its effects on the liver. About 40% of patients had elevations in liver enzymes, uh, and therefore patients had to be treated very slowly uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, with frequent blood checks. It also had to be taken four times a day. Uh, and, and frankly, if someone could remember to take their medicine four times a day, they actually wouldn't need Cognex. Uh, so, so it was a kind of a paradox. 
Uh, now, Aricept is a drug which is given once a day uh, and has a very acceptable side effect profile. There are three drugs currently under review by the FDA. Uh, they are Exelon or Rivastigmine, Chromam or Metrifenate, and Synapton, I love these names, Synapton um, or Bisystigmine. And there are other drugs which are under development or being looked at that have not been yet submitted to the FDA. So we have two therapies available, uh, and we have a series of therapies which are evolving. And I think it means that what's going to happen is that uh, there will be several compounds on the market. You're going to get used to using one of them. You're going to understand its effects and side effects and how to work with it. There's no obvious way to choose among the different cholinesterase inhibitors at this particular point in time. Maybe as we understand them better, we'll be able to say something more definitive about which one to use. Now here's the kind of response that one gets if you give a drug like Aricept. First of all, the patients get better on placebo. This is because patients respond to good care like they get in a clinical trial. They're seen frequently by a nurse, all their needs are taken care of, the social worker is involved with them, and the patients do a lot better. And then that placebo effect wears off and the patient gradually deteriorates. If the patient is given 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams of denepazil, they improve, and they maintain that improvement uh, for at least the 24 weeks of the study. And there's now evidence that that, main, that improvement is maintained over about a two-year period. So although they are getting worse, they are getting worse at a slower rate and a different rate of decline than if the patient is not receiving such a medication. On the other hand, see that it's completely symptomatic. That is, when the drug is stopped, the patient falls to the level that they would have been had they never been treated. So this doesn't have any effect on the course of Alzheimer's disease. What it is, is symptomatic treatment for the cholinergic disturbance, and patients benefit from that. Well, what about the duration of treatment? Is it only the mild patients who benefit, or could later patients also benefit? Well, here are uh, patients uh, that were treated with metrifenate, another one of the cholinesterase inhibitors. And these are patients who had many mental states above 18. That is, they were mildly affected, and after week 12, you can see that there was about a two-point difference on this particular test between the, the treated patients uh, and the placebo patients with treatment here uh, and minus score being good. This is a, a beneficial uh, response. On the other hand, if you look at patients who had scores below 18, that is, they were actually more affected, they have almost a four-point difference between placebo uh, and the treatment group. So these drugs look like they continue to work pretty deep into the illness. We're not how sure how far into the illness they go, uh, but certainly into the, uh, the um, moderate phases. Now, I thought you might be interested in seeing a little bit about uh, what these uh, drugs do on, uh, on brain, to, due to brain function. Here's a patient where we ask them to do the digit span test. That is, the patient just has to say, um, it listens to a series of numbers and then repeats the number. So the examiner says 9106 and the patient has to say 9106. And we're monitoring blood flow through the brain with fMRI while that task is going on. And you can see that there's a lot of posterior cortex lit, lit up here, more so on the left, because left and right are reversed on these scans, and on the right, as you would expect for a verbal task. Now, after we give them a cholinesterase inhibitor, look what happens. There's actually less activation, because the patient has to struggle much less to produce the similar performance on the same task. So we can see that the patient is actually struggling less as reflected in reduced blood flow, reduced increases in blood flow uh, after they have been treated with a cholinesterase inhibitor. There's also a behavioral effect of cholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, this is something that we've been particularly interested in. So again, uh, this is uh, metrifenate data. And what you see is that patients on metrifenate or on, here's the placebo group in pink, here's the metrifenate uh, group in yellow, and these are the changes uh, from baseline, and this is improvement going up and deterioration going down. You can see that there was much more improvement in the metrifenate group compared to the placebo group. That was true of apathy, it was also true of anxiety, it was also true uh, that there was a statistically significant difference uh, in the placebo group compared, in the metrifenate group compared to placebo on the total score of this behavior. So you can see that there are behavioral effects as well as cognitive effects. Finally, if you look at nursing home placement, this is a study done with Tacrin, what you can see is that those patients who receive treatment are placed in nursing homes at a substantially slower rate 
than patients who do not receive treatment. So if you take the 50% mark here, it occurs after about three months in this particular study on placebo, and after about five months in this particular study in patients who were, who were receiving Tacrin. So there are behavioral effects, there are cognitive effects, there are nursing home effects from treatment with cholinesterase inhibitors. So we think that these drugs really do have uh, a, a range uh, of beneficial responses. Just to make the point that there may also be important interactions between cholinesterase inhibitors and estrogen replacement therapy. See that these women who received both Tacrin and estrogen replacement therapy did substantially better on this Alzheimer's disease assessment scale than those who either were on Tacrin without estrogen replacement therapy uh, or uh, were on placebo. So we think that drug interactions may also uh, be very important. So uh, finally, we come to the dementia syndrome itself, and then I'll open this up for questions. The dementia syndrome, of course, occurs, uh, includes both cognitive abnormalities, memory, language, and visual spatial skills. Remember that first slide where we talked about the clinical syndrome. And it also includes a variety of behavioral disturbances, including agitation, depressive symptoms, anxiety, apathy, irritability, and psychosis, which means then that there is uh, a great place for psychotropic medication in the appropriate management of the Alzheimer's disease patient. We try to avoid psychotropics to the extent we can. They have side effects in elderly individuals. But in many cases, we cannot avoid the use of psychotropics, and therefore uh, they are used. So they, there's a role for antipsychotics, anti-agitation agents, antidepressants, anxiolytics, and in some cases, sedative hypnotics. So here's the, the summary. Uh, that our model here is one of amyloid aggregation leading to nerve cell loss, leading to a biochemical deficit, and to a dementia syndrome. We're searching in the laboratories of the world now for anti-amyloid anti -amyloid agents that will affect this process. We have available to us right now vitamin E, selegiline, estrogen, and non-steroidals, and we have reasonable data on vitamin E and selegiline, pretty reasonable data on estrogens. We're still kind of in the dark about non-steroidals. We have cholinesterase inhibitors available to us to address the biochemical deficit, and we have psychotropic agents available to address the behavioral problems. So here's the therapeutic regimen for Alzheimer's disease that I use. I give patients 2,000 international units of vitamin E in order to reduce the progression of the disease. If it's a woman who is not on estrogen replacement therapy, uh, I refer her to her primary care physician or her obstetrician and gynecologist and ask them to make a decision about whether the total women's health care can withstand or can support the addition of estrogens as part of her therapeutic regimen because from a neurological point of view, estrogens appear to be beneficial. But of course, you can't have one dimensional look at estrogens. They are too complicated. They have adverse effects. And therefore, uh, you need to take the total health care picture into account uh, before estrogen replacement therapy is given. We give a cholinesterase inhibitor thera therapy, and we look at both the improvement in cognitive symptoms and the improvement in behavioral symptoms. At that point, after we have monitored the response, if there are still residual behavioral symptoms, we would add psychotropic medication. So you can see that we are moving towards structured polypharmacy to affect multiple steps in the cascade. We have very little evidence about drug interactions in this cascade at this point, uh, but that's part of the ongoing research agenda. So let me just summarize the things that I, uh, the points that I'd like to make uh, in terms of thinking about uh, the presentation this evening. First of all, uh, treatment depends on diagnosis, uh, and we now are much better at diagnosis by applying the kind of criteria that I reviewed, memory impairment, uh, visual spatial impairment, language impairment in a person uh, without motor symptoms. We think that central to Alzheimer's disease is the amyloid cascade, and one of the most exciting areas of research is the, uh, are to, uh, to find ways of reducing amyloid uh, production or aggregation or increasing amyloid removal. We know that this interacts with the cerebral reserve that the individual brings to the disease. That is, smarter individuals, uh, people with, high, with uh, higher educational levels are less likely to get this illness. So there's an exciting interaction between the host and the production of the amyloid. Finally, we now have available to us mechanism-based therapies that will slow the progression of the disease, like vitamin E and its antioxidant properties, and improve the symptoms of the disease, like cholinesterase inhibitors. 
I'll stop there and take your questions. Yes, I'd like to thank Dr. Haggerty, by the way. He has, he's been the absolute gentleman of this uh, whole uh, process of, of uh, the arranging the Dolan Lecture. So, Dr. Haggerty, thank you very much for all your help. I have two questions. The first is, would you recommend that all Down syndrome patients be placed on vitamin E and Tacrin? And if so, when? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's deal with them separately. Take vitamin E to begin with. Um, I think if the patient is likely to survive uh, into middle age, that is, they don't have cardiac disease or some other disease which is going to end their life, um, then there are good reasons to try to keep them at the highest possible functional level. Uh, and, and a good argument can be made for vitamin E, given what we know about the pathology of late downs. Knowing now that you're already making a leap from true Alzheimer's disease uh, as we see it in an elderly individual to Alzheimer's disease as we see it in Downs. It's probably the same process. There's every indication that it is. Nevertheless, there's already a leap there where, where you're extrapolating the data as opposed to being well-grounded in data. Now, we wouldn't use Tacrin. We would use, at this point in time, Denepazil because it has the lower, uh, it has uh, no hepatotoxicity. That effect is unique to Tacrin. Uh, and I would only do that if they were symptomatic. Because, that is, that they were dementing because uh, the cholinesterase inhibitors have no effect on the actual disease process. It only re they only respond to the cholinergic deficit, and therefore you would benefit only after symptoms are present. But in that circumstance where I had a Down syndrome patient that was beginning to dement, absolutely I would give them cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, second question, uh, any data, I'm sure on the West Coast you have at least as much if not more use of herbal supplements as we do here on the East. A lot of patients come in taking, um, I think it's ginkgo, biloba. I, I bet if you were asked to raise a hand, there's probably some in this room. Any data? Yeah, there was one very interesting study in JAMA last year on ginkgo. Turns out that ginkgo is one of the most well-studied uh, uh, herbal substances. Uh, most of the other, other substances we have no evidence about whatsoever. But ginkgo was actually studied in a kind of reasonable double-blind clinical trial. Uh, and what they showed is that using a neuropsychological test, there was a small improvement in the ginkgo-treated group. But it, when the uh, investigator was asked to guess who is on placebo and who is on ginkgo, they could not distinguish the two. So although the effect could be measured by a neuropsychologist who was using fine-grained memory tests, the, drug, the, the effect was not visible uh, uh, in terms of distinguishing it from placebo to the clinician taking care of the patient or to the caregiver. So uh, there is some evidence that there's a very mild effect of ginkgo. The important thing for me was that um, uh, there were no side effects of the, uh, of the drug given at 12 milligram doses in that particular study. So when my, just as you're implying, uh, many of my patients come in on ginkgo. And so the, 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 the caregiver says, well, should I, you know, can I continue this or should I stop it? Uh, I tell them that there's very little evidence to support its use, but if for some reason they think it's useful, uh, that I am satisfied from the study that there were no adverse side effects from the drug. Very brief, lastly, if you were, if you were found out you were APOE4 homozygote, would you start taking uh, 2,000 milligrams of E a day? I wouldn't wait for that. <laughs> Thank you. Doctor, you have made a lot of emphasis about vitamin E. Incidentally, I was at a meeting of the American College of Cardiology and there was Dr. Mehta from Florida. He spent whole one hour on vitamin E and mentioned that the vitamin E that we give, the synthetic form, is actually counterproductive. It does not have the antioxidant effect. And what he was looking for, a vitamin E, which may be derived from a vegetable source. And of course, I suggested probably he could use the wheat germ oil. He spent whole one hour almost negating the effect of vitamin E as an anti antioxidant. The kind of vitamin E is being supplied. Uh, we used uh, DL alpha tocopherol, and it was tested in the laboratory for its, effect, for its antioxidant effect for cultured amyloid. Uh, and that's why we chose that particular form of alpha tocopherol, uh, and that's why we chose that particular dose of alpha tocopherol. 
Vitamin E enters the brain very reluctantly, so that's why small doses wind up in your urine but not in your brain. So you have to have high doses to enter the brain. But there was definitely an antioxidant effect in the laboratory. That's why this was chosen by the NIA-sponsored uh, clinical trial of, of, of vitamin E. And you see that there was a clinical benefit from two types of antioxidants, which was vitamin E and selegiline, and they were of comparable size. So, uh, you know, we, obviously we didn't biopsy the patients to determine whether there was an antioxidant effect. Um, uh, but from all the inferential evidence that we have, both from the laboratory and from the clinical studies, there was a beneficial effect, and the only effect that is known uh, for vitamin E in these doses is its antioxidant effect. So here you have a clash of two different people having two different sets of beliefs, and, and uh, this is not so uncommon, uh, but I think the data would support its use. Thank you. Now you're getting your exercise, you see. <laughs> you wish you hadn't got that microphone pretty soon. <laughs> Dr. Cummings, I was wondering, at what point during the diagnostic workup or your treatment regime do you refer the patient and their families to the Alzheimer's Association or to daycare uh, treatment centers? OK, okay. Um, really a good question. Uh, uh, here's the way we do it at UCLA. Bring the patient in and we do a careful cognitive assessment, medical history, uh, do a neurological examination and decide what laboratory tests are necessary. We then send them out to get maybe an MRI or and certainly they're going to get a B12 level and thyroid level and that sort of thing. They come back when those are complete and we have what's called a family conference. Uh, and at that family conference, uh, we give the diagnosis and we give that very carefully. That is, first we meet with the family and make sure that we have a consensus about how the diagnosis is going to be presented because some families really don't want the word Alzheimer's used. We think it's beneficial to get it out in the open and to use the word, but if a family really objects, we always honor the family's wishes. We then meet with the family and the patient together, talk about whatever they have um, uh, decided that, we're, that in, together we're going to say, uh, and at that point we refer them to the Alzheimer's Association uh, and any other necessary community resources. Daycare might be among them. Uh, there are other kinds of resources, uh, 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 you know, health home, home health aides are among the most popular in California right now. So there are other kinds of resources that we refer them to. And the Alzheimer's Association has this, in LA County, has a, a, a wonderful resource guide that actually lists all the resources available and we give the family the resource guide. So thank you for reminding me to bring the Alzheimer's Association into this lecture. Why shouldn't everyone be on vitamin E and how much? Right. Well, that's, it's a good question. Um, first of all, we do try to make these decisions based on data. And we have one data point, which is that patients with moderate disease had a slowing of that disease when follow, followed over a two-year period. So it, it is too much to extrapolate that to the general population. You're just, you know, you're just taking one data point too far. Now, the, the logic would suggest that people at risk for the disease might be benefited by taking vitamin E. And we are just now starting to recruit for what we're calling the minimum cognitive impairment protocol, where we're taking elderly individuals and ask them to, to be in a study if they have some degree of memory impairment, which is greater than usual for aging, but certainly does not meet criteria for any kind of dementia syndrome. And those individuals are going to be put either on a cholinesterase inhibitor, on a placebo, or on vitamin E, and followed until they have a diagnosis of dementia. And we're going to see whether that conversion takes longer for a patient who is either on a cholinesterase inhibitor or on vitamin E than it does for a patient who is on placebo. If that turns out to be the case, and that's, let's say vitamin E slows that conversion process, then we would be on much firmer, firmer grounds to say that elderly individuals without dementia, but who are beginning to experience uh, memory problems, would benefit from treatment with vitamin E. But, but we need the data, and it is, it, it is uh, I think, too tempting uh, to try to extrapolate one piece of, of information too far. I take 1,200 international units. <laughs> Is there any data on uh, the 
influence of uh, small vessel disease and decreased blood flow uh, to the cerebral cortex? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's unresolved, but a fascinating area of research. And uh, one, there's, a, there's a great study that I wanted to, wanted to mention. This allows me to do it called the Nunn Study. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the, the Sisters of Notre Dame have entered a study uh, where uh, they have uh, allowed themselves to be examined neuropsychologically every two years, uh, and they have pledged their brains at autopsy for study. Uh, so it establishes this wonderful data set of a, a very uh, homogenous group of high-functioning individuals uh, who are followed into late age and who are tested repeatedly, and then have, we have the ability to, to uh, examine the brain. Um, uh, so far, there have been several very enlightening studies uh, of, uh, from that uh, set of brains, uh, and one of them was that if, it, if the nun had both small vessel disease and a little bit of Alzheimer's disease, far less than would normally produce memory impairment, they will actually have the memory impairment because of the synergy of the two processes coexisting. So what we know is that if, if they have even a little bit of vessel disease and a little bit of Alzheimer's disease, they'll look like they have a lot of Alzheimer's disease because of the interaction of the two pathological processes. So there's, there, there will be a good argument to try to uh, prevent both late onset cerebrovascular disease as well as late onset Alzheimer's disease or to modify the course of both of those. By the way, the nun study, just to, just to take off on that for a moment, one of the things these nuns did was to write a biography when they entered the convent at age 20. And now they're in their 70s. So it's now possible to look back at a calculated ideational content of the biography written at age 20 and look at the relationship and its predictive value for dementia at, at age 70 or 75. And that's where one of the pieces of data was that those people who had high ideational contents, presumably high intellectual function, were much less likely to manifest Alzheimer's disease than were people who had low ideational content uh, and, and, and low intellectual function. So it was a, it's a fascinating data set because there is this 50-year-old piece of writing which exists on these people who are now uh, in, in uh, older age. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Dr. Jones. <laughs> That's right, Dr. Smith. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. You, Dr. you, you clarified. Uh, uh, you know, the minds of even young people. <laughs> uh, a, a topic that is always way out here. It's been brought back right into our understanding, at least mine. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I need to make an apology. I forgot something. Uh, Jerry Machevsky, Dr. Machevsky, was very instrumental in suggesting this wonderful clinician and helping us to get him here. Jerry, I want to thank you very much. <laughs> you all come to dinner now. We have uh, Chris has outdone himself again, so please come and join us for uh, the uh, refreshments. and. Uh, Please, everybody, be here next year. All right. Thank you again. Being a non-physician, yeah. the estrogen theory, will that work? I mean, if yeah. you're older, I mean, without the side effects of the feminine right. whatever. It, it's a logical question. I wish I had thought about that. One of, the, one of the interesting things that happens in men is that testosterone is converted to estrogen. Oh, really? So we have a lifelong source of estrogen in the brain. But that implies then that Alzheimer men might do better with higher levels of testosterone because it would be converted to higher levels of estrogen and it looks like estrogens are beneficial. And so we have just now started a study where we are giving testosterone to elderly men and elderly men with Alzheimer's disease to try to sort out this very possibility. This doesn't have other effects on it. Well, we'll have to see. Uh, we, uh, you know, we're going, to, we, we're going to know. If you see a bunch of buffed up Alzheimer's disease patients in California, you'll know that they're in our study. <laughs>